can't think we're live. Um, okay, I'm gonna actually pop in here okay. and uh, welcome people. Okay, hi there. Um, I'm Brighton with Friends of Trees, and we're very excited to be having our first live live webinar. Um, so bear with us as we get started here. Hopefully, everything is working. If you're having any problems, um, you can uh, just send me an email, brightonw at friendsoftrees.org, or give us a call at 503-595-0212, and uh, we'll hopefully get those straightened out. If there's any problems, this will this is being recorded, and it will be available uh, on this page again as soon as it's done, um, so you'll be able to go back and see things again. Um, but I want to just start uh, getting started here. So you can, uh, like I, you can see down below this video, you can head over to our YouTube page and chat if you have a YouTube account or those other ways you can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love for you to place an order today. Um, but I want to introduce our special guest, who is Jim Gershbach. So Jim's been a long term, a long time volunteer with Friends of Trees. He's been a crew leader, a pruning leader, uh, is involved always in the selection of these trees. He's grown many of these trees. He's planted most of these trees. Um, he is also a volunteer with the Hoyt Arboretum, and he works for Portland Parks and Rec Urban Forestry. So with that, I'm going to let you let Jim tell you kind of how this is going to go, and then we'll kick off the presentation. Thanks very much, Brighton. Um, good evening. Normally I get to do this with face-to-face uh, -face presentations, but tonight we're coming into your home. Uh, we hope to Give you information that will help you make a good decision about a tree you're going to love for decades to come. We have uh, tonight divided um, our trees into seven lists by uh, planting strip width. So the width of your planting strip will start with the very smallest ones. Those are the two and a half to three foot strips. Doesn't matter whether you have overhead wires or not. The same list of trees um, appears whether you have overhead wires or not. And all of those trees on the A list, as we call it, that small list, do appear again in the three by four foot planting strip. So if you're in either of the two smallest strips, pay attention because the first uh, group of trees will uh, be available to both of you. Um, and then in the second group, I will only show pictures of the trees that are available in that group that have not earlier been shown. And that will be true throughout tonight's presentation. So if you um, are in a larger size strip and you're tuning in early, uh, pay attention because that tree may be um, shown in an earlier size strip and we will indicate on the slide whether or not it's also available in a bigger strip. All right, well, let's start with those smaller strips. They're very difficult, of course, to find trees that will mature at a full height and width that's not too large for those strips. And I'm really excited to say that uh, Friends of Trees this year has found a hard to come by evergreen tree. Evergreens are the best kinds of trees for, for our environment because it rains a lot here, as you can tell in winter, it's raining tonight. And these trees intercept the most winter rainfall. They're also trees that um, provide year round benefits of noise reduction. And it's just nice to have something green and living in the middle of our bleak winters. And box leaf azara, which comes from Chile, which has a rainy climate very similar to Oregon's, is the perfect tree for this type of uh, winter rainfall environment. They're very fast growing. I've grown this tree in a couple locations and um, they will put on uh, so almost a foot or more a year of growth. They're very delicate as you can see from the photo here. Um, and what's nice about them is they don't seem to be bothered by pests or diseases. They're kind of in an unusual um, uh, genus Azara so there's not a lot of close relatives here in the Northwest. Um, and so that's another benefit. They don't seem to have difficulties with pests or diseases so far. They are um, wonderfully vanilla scented in the late winter as well. The flowers are small. You might not even notice them. They're kind of a golden color, very close to the branches. But when you go out someday in March and you get right up to the tree, you'll get this wonderful scent of vanilla. But mostly it's a trouble-free, fast-growing uh, tree that screens out um, uh, the neighbors, let's say, throughout the year. So moving on then to our next tree, uh, also following along with the fragrance theme, we have fragrant snowbell. These are trees that are related to the Japanese snowbell that's becoming quite common in Portland. This is a little less common, 
There's two in front of the Kennedy School in Northeast Portland, if you know those two trees there. And in May, late May generally, close to Memorial Day is when they bloom, you will see these uh, big masses of white flowers about an inch across. They can sometimes be hidden um, because the leaves are much larger on the fragrant snowbell than they are on the Japanese snowbell. Interestingly, both the Japanese snowbell and the fragrant snowbell are from Japan. And as such, these trees are, are not necessarily the most drought tolerant. They will um, like protection from hot afternoon sun, so I would not suggest getting one if you're in a baking hot uh, west exposure. And definitely a tree that for the first several years should be given water in the summer to look its best. And they do prefer better soils. But if you can provide those conditions and you really like white flowers and something that uh, blooms at a time of year when the days are longest, this might, might be a choice for you. This shot here is of the trees in the fall. As you can tell, the fall color doesn't get much better than that, so if you're really looking for a great fall color tree, the snowbells are, are not necessarily that tree. Um, the fruits on them are very dry, little um, round nutlets, as you can see in the upper right, and not much problem at all. They usually fall off about the same time as the leaves. And then um, we'll move on to our next tree, which is um, one that grows I like it enough I grow it in my backyard, but it does have some um, unusual attributes that I'll talk about. One is that you can't see this tree in the wild anymore. It has gone extinct in its native Georgia. Um, it was found there in the 18th century, and that makes it really dependent on humans to grow it in their yards. It is a tree, though, that was found growing along a riverbank, and it does seem to want summer water. It is probably one of the least drought-tolerant trees I know of, that we can grow. So if you're willing to more water that it demands, you'll be rewarded with two things. One, white camellia-like flowers. They look like single white camellias, um, big yellow egg yolk type anthers in the middle, about two to three inches across, very showy. And those flowers appear remarkably at the end of summer. August, September are the peak times What's really nice is as the tree starts to color up in the late September, early October, it will still be blooming with white flowers. It's the only tree I know of in our temperate zone that will have red fall color, really a good scarlet, and white flowers all at the same time of year. So for that reason alone, it, it may be an exciting choice for you. It is a little spindly, as you can see here. They, are, they don't provide dense shade, um, and the branches can be somewhat weak as you they don't put on a lot of uh, thickness to them. And so it's often the case that in a heavy winter snowfall, particularly in early winter, that some of the branches may, may break, and that might be of concern. So not a tree that um, has uh, no defects, but certainly a tree that has a lot of uh, pizzazz when it comes to flowers and fall color. Two um, other trees that um, a lot of people ask about are the ivory, silk, and summer charm tree lilacs out of China, one from Japan and the second one, Pekinensis, out of China. Now, I love lilacs, and most people think of the, the fragrant blue and purple lilacs. These are not those uh, shrubs. These are actually small trees that bloom in the May, so a little later than the regular lilacs, and their flowers are always a white or cream color. Now, Personally, one of the things that, um, the, although these are certainly showy, as you can see here on the screen, they're big trusses, showy cream. One of the things that makes them a little less appealing in my mind is that the, after they've turned brown, they will hang on onto the tree. And so you get um, this kind of browning effect, which some people don't like. A um, couple of other things, if you were looking to distinguish between them, ivory silk is the shorter of the two cultivars that we're offering. It's an upright spreading tree, as we said, out of Japan, getting to about 20 feet tall. The summer charm probably has more interest in the bark on it, as you can see here, has this smooth, almost cherry-like effect, a little bit of peeling, somewhat like a paper bark, not quite that good, kind of a bronze color, um, and that makes it a winter interest tree as well. Um, tree lilacs, like regular shrub lilacs, are subject to a number of diseases, so I would not say that they're completely uh, hard as nails type of tree. They're very cold hardy, however. They will survive the worst of our winters. And they are mildly interesting in the fall. This is the fall color, not a very good photo in 
terms of focus, but I wouldn't say this is a tree to get if you're really interested in sharp uh, golds or orange, red, and fall colors. Um, snowbells, uh, related to the fragrant snowbell that we saw earlier, um, is a, pink, a kind of a somewhat rare pink flowering form called pink chimes, selected for these pink flowers that you can see here. Very showy, abundant flowers. Pink chimes is a little shorter than the regular species, which can, the regular species can get to be 30 feet tall or so. This is about half that to two thirds that. And um, flowering time is the same time of year. Um, but one attribute that snowbells have, in addition to their flowers, is they just have very tidy, neat, clean foliage. They don't tend to drop leaves during the growing season. And they do have this, um, with age, they do develop a nice, somewhat striated or striped bark, which you can see there. Now, snowbells are not color trees, so again, if that's important to you, uh, the tree. But they will definitely impress your friends when they're strolling by your house at the, uh, just before Memorial Day. Um, snowbells tend to be a little bit slower growing, and they do have to be pruned carefully to make sure that they're limbed up for passage of pedestrians and traffic. But they don't seem so far to have many pests. Now, this is a tree you can also get in your... Uh, lists for the three to four foot strips. Now the last tree we have on our um, uh, list for the A 2.5 to, 2 to 3 list are the strawberry trees. This is a tree out of southern Europe and as you might expect for the Mediterranean climates of Portugal and North Africa and Spain and Italy and southern France where it's native to, it's very drought tolerant which makes it a good choice. Increasingly we're seeing our summers drying out here and it's nice to have uh, a tree that can, uh, after it's established, the uh, normal rainfall we get in the winter and the spring. It is adapted for wet winters, dry summers. The other thing that's nice about it, as you can see here, this is the unripe. It starts out kind of a yellow, turns orange, and eventually when it's fully ripe, it's the color of a strawberry, hence the name strawberry. And these fruits are, are very much uh, enjoyed by our local bird life and animal life, so it uh, is a great tree for that reason. The fruits are actually edible, although a little insipid. They do make them into preserves in Europe, so it is part of an edible landscape, um, although the name Unido means I eat one because they're not that great tasting just fresh off the tree, but they can be made into preserves, and Europeans do that. Um, the all th other nice thing about them is this foliage that you see here is evergreen, and so the tree makes for um, a great hideout for the birds that stay here during the winter and don't migrate. And we have a lot of deciduous trees, probably an overabundance, not many evergreens. And so when you can provide uh, places for birds to get out of the winter wind, you increase bird survival over the cold winters. So that's another reason to grow the strawberry tree. Um, moving then to our next size list, three to four feet. Everything you saw that was available in the A list camera. is also available in this list, and there are three additional choices. The black hawthorn, um, in this case not snow cone Japanese snowbell, but the straight species Japanese snowbell, and a first time ever offer of the summer sprite linden tree, which is a smaller version of the much larger little leaf linden that we see planted uh, in the city. So let's dive into those three additional choices that you have on list B. Yeah. So the black hawthorn, it's a native, and we like to offer natives because they're very well adapted to our summer uh, climates with dry summers and winter uh, rainfall. Um, it's not a very large hawthorn. It gets to be about 15 feet tall and maybe that wide. Um, but it is very uh, tolerant of sunshine. In fact, it prefers to grow in sun, and it's extremely drought tolerant once established. The other nice thing about black hawthorns is this is a tree that our native birds have evolved with, and they do uh, very much come to depend on the black fruits. That's the why it's called the black hawthorns. The little fruits that you see in the picture to the right are, are very much relished by our native birds. And unlike most natives, which do not have uh, reddish fall color, it does usually have some kind of red fall color. Not especially as good, say, as a Franklinia, but not brown or yellow like a lot of native trees. Um, one thing to keep in mind, like all hawthorns, it does have some thorns. There's one there. But I wouldn't say that's a reason not to grow it. Um, they're easily removed if you're worried about um, uh, injury. And as the tree gets older, they become less and less of an issue. 
So a good native tree, this is a mature one, a fast grower, a little bit of suckering, which is true of a lot of the hawthorns. Those are easily removed with a pair of hand pruners, and you've got yourself um, a tree that will probably live about 50 years. Hawthorns are not as exceptionally long-lived trees, but um, I think it's something that is exciting because it is native and uh, a tree that uh, fits into our native ecosystems very well. Now, the uh, snow cone is a particular cultivar. Uh, we were uh, already sold out of that, so I'm showing pictures here on the, uh, in here, the flowers are identical on the straight species Japanese snowbell. It's probably our most popular tree that we planted over the last 10 years. Uh, the straight species came to 30, 25 to more like 25 to 30 feet. And these are trees that are very popular because of their clean foliage, their um, slightly fragrant white flowers, and the fact that they have um, a, a nice regular form, uh, a little bit spreading with age. And so that's the um, Japanese snowbell. Now, summer sprite little leaf lindens. So this is a tree that is only half the size of the regular linden tree. So if you're thinking lindens are too big for your small strip, we think this is a way to bring the uniform regular branching and the dense shade that a summer sprite, or that the little leaf lindens can bring. Summer sprite brings that down to these smaller strips. And in addition, it is the most fragrant tree we probably offer at Friends of Trees. Anytime in June when you're out under a linden, you're going to smell that delicious honey scent. Nectar-rich yellow flowers will attract bees to your tree, so it's great for the local pollinators. And it is a tree that um, we've not been able to offer before. It's just being brought out by the nurseries. Now, like all little leaf lindens, there may be a problem later in the summer with uh, drought stress if the trees are not carefully watered, and that can attract aphids which can sometimes leave honeydew, which is kind of a, res a residue that they can drop from uh, aphid infestation. So something to keep in mind, um, lindens are trees that you definitely want to water, and um, they do have uh, needs for good soil. They like good soil. They also like to have a fairly wide root zone, so not the kind of tree that you should be um, planting other things directly underneath because of the dense shade in that, that root system. All right, so moving to our uh, kind of more mid-sized uh, strips. These are power uh, places without power lines. So in this strip, uh, the first tree we have to offer is, uh, and this is also going to be available, this first tree available on the um, list with power lines, as well as the F list, which is uh, eight feet and above with power lines, I believe. And that is the American hornbeam. So this is also called the muscle wood because it's very, very strong wood. Um, grows somewhat slowly, but in exchange, the wood on it is very solid, not a tree that's going to break apart in ice storms. Uh, it's going to keep its limbs on it very regularly. The fall color um, can be as great as the tree that you see on the right, which is this excellent red, but often can vary and may be, um, because these are seedling grown, can be an orange or even a gold. They're all nice, um, although most people uh, see some of the red flower, uh, the, the red fall color ones, and they really like those. Um, so you may get lucky and get a, a red one, but you will, at all costs, get a tree that is um, able to fit nicely into those middle sized strips. If you give it water, it will respond and grow faster, and that's true of most of the trees that we have here. So if slower growth is an issue, make sure you do water it regularly. Um, the flowers on these are insignificant. In the fall, they have a small dry nutlet, so they're a fairly tidy tree, and that nutlet will drop off um, in the fall after the about the time of the leaves. So American hornbeam, you can see here some of the other color. Um, this is a, a different cultivar, a different uh, clone. You can see it has more orange um, uh, fall color on them, but very uh, tidy when they're uh, during the summer months, the veins on these trees make them a very uh, attractive tree. So attractiveness, uh, you can't get much more attractive than American yellowwood when it's in bloom. And these are a tree from the eastern United States, very sparse native range. They come from uh, scattered places. Some of the places where they're from are uh, kind of river canyons. And they are imperiled and actually endangered in a lot of their range. Um, several dams have been built that have flooded out those um, river uh, cliffs and too. So it's not commonly see in the wild. 
but it has been brought into cultivation, and its main claim to fame is these was at the same time Japanese snowbells would be blooming. And um, let me go back to that. Um, oops. <laughs> Let's see. Previous. Uh, so the yellowwood, the um, wisteria-like flowers, they're going to only appear on trees after they get to be about 8 to 12 feet tall. So you do have to have some patience. Now, typically, friends of trees, uh, the trees we give to people uh, and sell are usually going to be in the 6 to 10 foot range. And this tree is one that needs to establish, take a few years to get its uh, feet and roots uh, developed. And then it tends to bloom heavily one year and then lighter the next. So you may see heavy bloom like this one year and then very few blooms the next. But it is a spectacular show. These are in the uh, legume family. And so they're followed by very small, flat, little um, uh, bean pod-like things that are uh, no more uh, difficult to sweep up than the leaves when they fall. Now, one of the things I really like about yellow wood, regardless of whether it's a heavy blooming year or, or just a regular year, is that you have nice butter yellow fall color and big leaves, so it's very showy. Um, this is an example of an older, um, an older tree uh, in northeast Portland that's been there for several decades. It's a long-lived tree. They can live well over 100 years, and so you're going to get reliable fall color most years. It is a tree that is not um, adapted to dry summers especially well, and will take several years of deep watering to get a good root system before it's able to really uh, go off on its own without summer water. So if you are willing to water it, I think you're going to get a good fall show. And every other year you should get nice um, listeria-like white blooms. Not a lot of pests and diseases either, which is kind of nice. And um, a tree that should be around for, for many years. There's several old examples, for example, out by Reed College. Now, the European hornbeam is a rock-solid... Um, urban favorite. It's a well adapted to living in urban conditions, very tidy tree. We've got the narrowest form around that we're on offering, uh, and that's the Franz Fontaine, which uh, gets fairly tall. It's about as tall as you can get in a strip this size, but only 10 to 15 feet wide at full maturity. It does have these nice, somewhat similar to the um, Carolina hornbeams, the American hornbeams, these veins that are here, nice lush green, tidy, tidy tree in the summer. And then it does have yellow fall color. Um, the flowers are insignificant, but it does have um, uh, a kind of an interesting hop-like um, fruit that is dry and papery and falls about the same time as the leaves. So tidy summer fall form, lots of um, upright growth, and uh, rock solid, very few pests and diseases, and very strong wood, not the kind of tree that's going to fall apart in an ice storm or, or a snowstorm. Now closely related to it, but a little wider and a little taller, is the pyramidal European hornbeam. You can see where um, these trees tend to be more upswept, and they can get 40, 45 feet tall. Um, the books sometimes suggest a little less. The ones I've seen in Portland seem to be very happy, and because it's a tree that can live from one to 200 years, um, it may very well reach the upper limit of that height. Um, but again, the branches will be upswept, and it's generally going to be easy for pedestrians and cars to get by these trees. Um, so solid, very few pests and diseases, long-lived trees, interesting kind of smooth gray bark, um, and that's the two hornbeams that we're offering this year. Um, and that's the fall leaves after they've fallen. Now, um, we don't offer a lot of elms. The American elms, of course, are subject to Dutch elm disease. But they have been um, species from Asia that have been crossed with others to get um, to disease-resistant elms. And one of the ones that is on offer this year is one of those hybrids. It's called Frontier, and it's unique in having this purplish-red fall color, probably its main claim to fame. It does have a beautiful vase shape, kind of this uh, gentle, delicate kind of uh, form. The elm leaf beetles, which can sometimes skeletonize the leaves on an elm, gets to be about 45 to 50 feet tall, but it'll stay relatively narrow, and it's a fast grower if you give it water. Now, I have not found this tree to be especially drought tolerant, particularly when it's young, but if you do give it water, it'll grow even faster, so that's a reason to do it. Um, here's what the fall color can look like, this solid purple, um, and about the time it's starting to turn fall color, it will flower. 
significant, but they're unusual in being also the same color as the fall uh, leaf. So frontier elm, um, something you can having to worry so much about um, elm, Dutch elm disease, and the added bonus of this nice fall color. So Lavelle hawthorns, probably one of the toughest hawthorns that you can get is the Lavelle hawthorn. It's a hybrid between uh, two North American species, and it seems to get a lot of its endurance from it, one of its Mexican parents. So it's very resistant to heat, very resistant to urban conditions. Uh, here's a tree, excuse me, that I planted about 20 years ago in North Portland. It's done very well over those years in a very um, difficult site, and they will produce um, glossy green leaves that uh, almost look evergreen. And they're one of the last trees to turn fall color, but in exchange, they will stay um, into the almost into mid-December. In fact, this was taken. This picture here was taken just uh, about a week ago. So into the month of December, you can extend fall color when other trees are bare and leafless. Lavelle hawthorns will still have nice foliage and fall color well into um, the month of December. As an added bonus, they have these haws that are red. They're showy. When the tree's leaves have fallen, sometimes they'll still be hanging onto the tree, and those generally will fall off sometime in the month of January. If we have a freeze, they can become a source of food for birds. Um, they're not that palatable to birds initially. It seems like it takes a good freeze to kind of soften them up, and perhaps as the birds have fewer things to eat, um, they come back to these trees and start to eat the, the haws that are found on those hawthorns. Not a very thorny tree, despite the name. This is probably one of the least thorny hawthorns. Particularly on old age, it's very difficult to even find thorns. They're mostly found on the new growth at the tips. And so on older trees, thorns would not be a problem. So um, for tough sites and tough conditions, a tree that you want to plant, give it a couple years of water, and, and then just kind of let it do its thing, this might be for those kind of perfect tree. Now, another tough customer, but also very attractive in fall, is the Persian ironwood. These are trees that come out of northern Iran, so they are adapted to drier conditions. And they are seedling grown, most of the ones that we offer, although we do offer one clone. But most of the, the ones that we offer will be in varying colors, gold to orange to this kind of red, orange, and even purple. So it's kind of fun to see which uh, fall colors you'll get. But regardless of the fall color, you're going to get a tree that's very much like an oak in terms of its slow growing but very solid wood. The name ironwood comes from the fact that this wood is strong. These are trees that will live well over 100 years or more, and they're going to have wood that will stand up to snow and ice storms. So uh, they also are tolerant to wind. They're not going to break apart in wind storms. And for that reason alone, I think they're um, proving to be where we planted them, they've proven to be very solid trees. Now they do require a little bit of pruning for the lower branches tend to be a wide spreading tree and um, you do need to make sure that uh, as the tree grows upright that these are removed. But if you do that you can get rewarded by a, um, a, a lovely tree. Uh, fall color is not that uh, is the main claim to fame but in many years time you'll get this excellent modeling bark um, and that can be uh, a nice feature to look forward to generally starts at about 10, 8 to 10 years, these trees start to do this. This is on a tree that's about 75 years old, so that can be a great winter interest as well. And it's a tree that does not have a lot of pests or diseases. Now we do offer a narrower, more upright form called Ruby Vase. It's a newer in the trade, um, and this one is supposed to have orange-red fall color, so the flowers are similar to the species, and you can see here they appear in the winter when the tree is leafless. They're somewhat interesting, but not particularly showy, uh, more of a novelty or a conversation piece, but, but not going to knock anyone's socks off. But ruby vase might be nice for the new leaves that come out in this kind of uh, brighter red color. Those fade to green, and then you get this orange-red fall color uh, a few months later in September, October. Now, we do offer another linden. Sterling silver lindens are... Um, a, silver lindens are very large trees. Sterling's a little more compact. Here's one that we planted in 2006. You can see it's a fast-growing tree. It's already pushing 20 feet. And again, like all of the lindens, it will have those beautiful honey-scented fragrant flowers that are nice to walk under 
and will attract bees in the spring, in the, in the, well, I guess it's late spring. Um, silver lindens, compared to the regular little leaf and other kinds of lindens, are more resistant to two pests that we don't yet have in Portland, but which could arrive here. Those are Japanese beetles and gypsy moss. And um, I heard reports that Japanese beetles have found their way to Boise, Idaho, so it could be just a matter of time before we have them in Portland. If so, regular linden trees are one of their favorite things to munch on, and so having silver linden gives you a little bit of an insurance against Japanese beetle uh, depredations. But regardless, they're a tree that has nice um, dense shade, and although they're very dense shade, they're lightened by the undersides of the leaves being a nice uh, silver, which is where they get the name silver lindens. Um, nice um, clean foliage, a little bit of fuzzy hair, that's probably why the Japanese beetles don't like to eat them, and it, fall color is kind of irregular at best. They do turn yellow, but unfortunately not all at once, so the uh, effect of all that yellow is somewhat lost because it's mixed in with the green. Um, we don't have this tree, I believe, um, Cycoprodia, um, so um, we'll skip over that. Uh, we moved it to the C. Oh, okay. So we'll go back to that, and I'll just talk about it and show you a picture. So um, Cycoprodia is actually offered on the four- to six-foot planting strip uh, lists, um, which I guess this is. It is a, the Persian ironwood that you saw earlier, the one with the pretty fall color, um, was crossed with an evergreen tree out of China, the Chinese fig hazel, and they came up with this very unusual, it's very unusual to get two different genuses of trees to produce fertile offspring, but that's what happened in this case. So the Cycopsis tree and the Parodia crossed, and of course they came up with Psychoparodia. And they call it semi-decidua because it may not necessarily lose all of its leaves in a mild winter. In a winter where the temperatures are very cold, it may actually um, become more deciduous. So a little hard to tell. It's going to be temperature dependent in uh, a world where the climate is warming. It may tend to be more evergreen. Most of the ones that I've seen, we've had uh, fairly cold winters the last couple of winters, and so it has tended to turn kind of this yellowish color, and the leaves have fallen. Um, they're fairly tough, like the Persian ironwood parent. I would say probably intermediate in terms of their drought tolerance between their Chinese parent and their um, Iranian parent, the Persian ironwood but mostly um, a fairly tall, relatively narrow for their height type of tree. 10 to 20 feet probably at the most and maybe 12 feet wide. But um, I have not seen pester diseases on them. I've grown a couple of them. And that, again, trouble-free, um, small flowers, not especially showy, um, and they don't have messy fruit, so uh, fairly clean and tidy tree. And very rarely offered. All right, so for our four to six foot lists, we have a lot of great choices for folks. These are with power lines. And this is an unusual tree out of uh, northern China. And that's a very dry place with hot summers and cold winters. So if you're looking for, again, a tough tree that will survive, um, this is one that will do that. And I've planted several in Portland, and they've all done remarkably well and grown fairly fast, even in fairly poor soils. Uh, has a funny name, Machia amarensis. Um, it was an Estonian explorer in the 19th century that uh, it's named for. These are trees that will get to be anywhere from 20 to 30 feet. They can get taller, uh, up to 45 feet in the wild, so you might, over many decades, see this tree pushing up a little little higher. than. But mostly a tree that um, is tough because it fixes on its roots. It has a symbiotic relationship with microorganisms that fix atmospheric nitrogen. And that enriches the soil, which makes it easier for it to soils that are not naturally very fertile. And that's a big advantage because it more or less is making its own fertilizer from the air. And you don't have to add any. Um, and one advantage of it, it does flower in the summer, alfalfa-scented flowers. But something I wasn't able to get a picture of to show in this presentation was when the new leaves emerge, and it's a compound tree with small leaflets, they have a wonderful kind of silvery sheen. And it's a wonderful experience in the spring to see a new Amor Machia that's leafing out. It'll have this wonderful silvery sheen. But um, a small tree that does, because it's the Mogum family, will produce these very small, not very problematic um, uh, seed pods that you can see here. Anywhere where there are flowers, you can see here the compound leaves and the small leaflets. It does make for an attractive foliage tree in the summer months. And you can see here with age, 
it does get this interesting kind of bronze brown bark, uh, a little bit like a cherry tree. So funny name, but a beautiful little tree. Now, Chinese dogwoods, they are without a doubt um, beautiful. They flower a little bit later than the eastern dogwoods. Um, they're available in just pink colors. And they're selected by Friends of Trees because they do resist the anthracnose that is causing so much problem and so much fatality in the eastern dogwoods and in our, unfortunately, our native Pacific dogwoods. They have excellent orange and red fall colors for the most part. And the bloom sits above the leaves. Um, so one way to tell a Chinese dogwood or Cornus cusa is that the leaves will be um, out at the same time as the tree is flowering. Eastern dogwoods tend to have their blooms first, then they leaf out. Now this is a tree that we also offer on a larger list F, which is the list for eight feet, or six feet with, um, with high voltage power lines. So you can get this for a couple of different planting strip lists. Most people have them, love them when they're in bloom, love them in the fall. They love the fact that they do have um, interesting pink fruits that the birds like. The one drawback is they are not summer drought tolerant and will definitely resent drying out. So it's a tree that um, is a little bit of concern to plant if you're going to uh, not give it water in the summer. It may not even survive and may need many, many, many years of uh, summer irrigation in order to get well established. If it does survive, then you can uh, look forward to this kind of mottled, flaking, exfoliating bark, somewhat similar to a, what you see in a sycamore. And then here is these uh, kind of otherworldly little fruits that appear on them, about the size of, say, a large marble. Um, now, one thing about dogwoods is um, they're <laughs> very popular, and they are overplanted in, in Portland. Which they're more prone to diseases and pests because of that high population density. So a tree that's popular, but perhaps a little too much loved for its own good. Now a tree that is, uh, should be loved more and is not overplanted uh, by any stretch is the Chinese pistache. In fact, you did not used to see any Chinese pistache in Portland. It's a tree you're more likely to see in hot, dry, difficult places like the Central Valley of California, so around Sacramento, where the temperatures can easily get over 90 most days in the summer months this tree will be sailing through those hot, dry summers beautifully. It also takes very poor soils, um, a tree that will get to 30, 35 feet tall, possibly more in the wild, it certainly can achieve that, and 25 to 40 feet wide. It has very small flowers um, that are kind of in little clusters, as you can see here on the left. Its main claim to fame, though, is it has bright red to orange fall color on a compound leaf, so it's a great tree for summer months, besides dappled shade, and then in the fall you get this wonderful fall color. But I like to recommend it because it has few pester diseases and it's just a tree that's not only uh, tough as nails but is going to probably be a good tree if our uh, climate warms as much as scientists are telling us it might in coming decades. It's a tree that can live easily 80 to 100 years um, and here's what uh, an old growth one in Chico, California looks like. You can see it does develop interesting bark these are the spring flowers. It does bloom before the leaves pop out. Now, it's male and female trees. The males don't have any fruits. The females produce a dry nutlet. And although it is related to the pistachios, these are not really edible nutlets, although the birds like them and the birds will eat them. So, magnolias. They're a great choice. Many of our flowering trees are short-lived and disease-prone, so we're actually encouraging people who like flowers to choose magnolias. And Galaxy was released by the National Arboretum, um, a tall, upright growing tree, about uh, 10 feet taller than it is wide. And it's very showy, large pink flowers, five inches to six inches across, will bloom before the leaves in the spring. And they are mildly fragrant. You can enjoy them up close and they have kind of a peppermint kind of flavor. Um, it's a tree that's been around about 30 years, and um, you can see here toward the end of spring, as the last of the leaves are flowering, the, the, the green leaves appear. Now, magnolias are not generally noted for fall color. Brown to yellow is probably the best you could say, but tidy growth um, and relatively fewer pests and disease compared to most flowering trees, and a little longer lifespan probably. You're probably looking more closer to 75, maybe even 100 years for this tree.
compared to some of the other flowering trees, which can be a lot shorter lived. So there's another close up look. Um, one thing is in rainy spring months, if we get a heavy rain, these petals can sometimes flop. And that's not a problem in drier climates with drier springs, but I have noticed sometimes they do suffer a bit from that heavy spring rainfall, can sometimes uh, spoil the flowers on them. Now, um, flowers on Golden Rain Tree are not going to be spoiled by rain because typically they appear in the summer months. And you can see one flowering here with these forsythia-like yellow flowers in the months of July, sometimes even into August. And it's a round-headed tree out of China, extremely fast growth. Um, so it blooms precociously, partly because when you plant them in the spring um, and they don't flower until the summer, occasionally you'll even get flowers that first year, but definitely by the second year it's usually flowering. And uh, for people who don't like to wait to start, this might be that kind of a tree. On the other hand, they're a tree that tends to live about 50 to 75 years, so they're on the shorter end of the life spectrum. Um, one of the things that's nice about them is they are the only tree that has this kind of paper lantern uh, seed capsule. So inside is a very tiny little black seed, but it's held inside these air-filled papery seeds that kind of end in the, in the spring, or excuse me, in the fall, and um, those will be in clusters and uh, can be kind of another conventional point of conversation. Um, here's what a mature tree looks like with those paper capsules brown. This tree is just beginning to get its fall color. Um, golden rain trees typically can have yellow fall color or even a nice orange. And then what's also nice about them is very quickly they develop these orange fissures in the, in the furrows of their bark. And that can be a nice feature as well. But if you want a fast growing summer flowering tree with these interesting fall um, paper lanterns and a reasonable chance for good fall color in the gold to orange range with interesting bark, this would be that tree. Now, um, we don't have a great photo here of Japanese hornbeams, but this does show you what the fall color looks like. These are very elegant trees. They're very clean and tidy. Um, the leaves are long and narrow, and they have these nice veins on them. They're a tree that I would suggest be grown where you get afternoon shade, and if you're willing to water it, and if you have reasonably good soil, they'll perform much better in those conditions than planted in full sun or with hot afternoon sun, where they have a tendency to scorch. But if you can reward them, they have a nice growth form, and they're um, really, the flowers are insignificant on them. They don't have messy fruits, so they're a fairly tidy tree, deciduous, of course, and you're left with a nice form even in the winter months. But they don't grow fast. Um, usually the ones we get from the nurseries, though, are fairly large size. Um, so a slow-growing tree with a nice, elegant form that definitely appreciates being out, out of the hot afternoon sun. And here you can see what the, um, the summer foliage looks like, this dentation that you see here at the teeth, and these dry, about two and a half inch uh, hop-like fruits that are uh, about the same time as the tree's leaves fall, that's about when these fall. So, uh, hummingbirds like to have tubular flowers to seek nectar from, and so we do provide um, an option for, for people that are interested in helping hummingbirds, that's the Pink Dawn Chitalpa. Again, uh, similar to the Psychoparodi we saw earlier, this is a rare intergeneric hybrid between the desert or native Arizona and New Mexico areas, desert tree that's very drought tolerant, crossed surprisingly with a tree from the eastern U.S., which is not at all drought tolerant. So Chitalpa tends to have the narrow leaves of its um, uh, desert willow parent, but it has the beautiful, showy, big, tubular flowers uh, that you see here that have kind of yellow throats. Those flowers appear in the summer months, so that's a time when very few things are blooming. And it apparently, because it is an intergeneric hybrid, it does not produce fertile seeds. Now, for people that know that one of the parents of this tree is the cigar tree, um, some people don't like the uh, seed pods on the cigar trees, this tree will not have those. It will only have the beautiful flowers, so kind of the best of everything without the, the worst of it. And you can see here, it's a small tree, will never get to be probably much more than about 20-some feet, but covered in flowers in the summer months, 
and those are good for um, our summer uh, hummingbird population. So Washington hawthorns. Um, we talked about Lavelle hawthorns earlier. This is a probably a close second in terms of toughness. This is what the trees look like in flower. They do have a kind of an apple-like blossom about a week or so to 10 days that they're in flower. Um, some people don't like the fragrance. Um, some people have likened it to kind of but they're in flower for a very short period of time and they are quite showy from certainly from a distance. Uh, and they bloom late in the year uh, relative to other spring flowering trees. They get to be um, one of the taller hawthorns, 25 to 30 feet and about 20 feet wide. Um, they are one of the most, uh, the trees that I would say of all the hawthorns, they probably have the best fall color. And it varies from kind of a golden orange color to even uh, this, as you can see here, kind of a nice red or even kind of purplish red. Um, but the main reason to grow them, I think, is the small haw fruits on these trees. And if you um, see them after the fall has, fall winds have blown the leaves off, you'll still see these cranberry red uh, haws on them in bright clusters. So on bright sunny days in the winter, these trees really stand out for that spectacular red color. And of course, if they are, um, if we experience a frost, birds are going to rely on these for late winter as a source of food for late winter. I've seen robins on days in the winter when everything else had been eaten and they were, they were then flocking to these trees. Now they do have thorns, but as you can see here, um, the thorns are not especially, it's not a cactus, they're not especially prevalent. Um, and relative to other hawthorns, they tend to be more disease resistant. Um, there's a lot of things that can attack hawthorns that are in the rose family. Certainly the English hawthorns are typically defoliated in the summer by fungal diseases. These are not affected in that same manner. Um, so more disease resistance and this chance for a great winter splash of color, just when we need it. Okay, we're going to move on to the folks who have a wider strip, six to eight feet without power lines. And these are where we can put our start putting larger trees that are going to provide shade. These are generally going to be longer lived trees. So it's very exciting. Um, we've already talked about some trees that can go on this list. That's the American Yellowwood, the Frontier Elm, and again, that slightly larger hornbeam that we talked about with the upswept branches, the pyramidal hornbeam. But we have, um, uh, I think, eight additional choices that you haven't seen yet. So let's look at those. So Accolade Elm, this is a, a great tree um, that was uh, chosen because it is an answer to the loss of all of those American elms that we lost to Dutch elm disease. It's an Asian hybrid, and it has the form somewhat reminiscent of those magnificent um, vase-shaped elm trees of, of past years that um, unfortunately we can't plant because of the Dutch elm disease. But because this is resistant and also resists elm leaf beetle, we're able to have a tree that has an upright shape, uh, makes a great shade tree, and even rewards with yellow fall color. Um, one thing about elms, and, and this accolade, um, the parent tree is about, um, about 90 years old and about 70 feet tall, uh, growing in um, uh, Illinois, so very hardy to cold. Um, one thing I like about this tree is the shape and the leaves are uh, the leaves are very attractive. Um, one thing though about accolades is they are not especially drought tolerant and would be a tree that you'd want to give good and ample water to avoid scorching. The same would be true of this next tree, the Dawn Redwood. Now this is a living fossil, it's Oregon State fossil. You can go to Eastern Oregon and find uh, leaves of this tree is on um, rocks from 14 million years ago. It looks like it may have died out about 7 million years ago. But we're reintroducing it to Oregon. Um, and it comes out of China. Um, seems to do quite well here in places where it can get um, access to either groundwater or be given regular summer watering. And this is a grove at Delta Park. And you can see they have nice buttressed um, roots, grow very upright, um, possibly... That were, the trees that are planted in the Western world have only been available out of China since the 1940s, but based on some of the old growth trees in China, we believe these will get 100 or more feet tall, but they will tend to stay fairly narrow, probably in the 20 to 25 foot range at the most, 
and quite a bit less than that when they're young, because they definitely reach for the sky. Um, now, they're a conifer, so they have small cones um, that are generally not going to be an issue like pine cones or, or Douglas fir cones. So very small cones, but they're interesting in that they're a deciduous conifer. So these very soft green needles that they have in the will turn a bright orange or tawny russet color in the fall, and they will foliate. So if you're someone that likes a little bit of seasonal change, but you're looking for a pest-free tree, these would be a good example of a conifer that's not closely related to a lot of other uh, deciduous trees that you could plant, and if you can give it the water it requires, you'll get beautiful, soft, green, delicate foliage, and then um, more sunlight in the winter underneath it. Here's what the needles look like up close. You can see these are not like spruces. They're going to be very soft to the touch. So if pedestrians pass by and accidentally brush up against them, they're not going to be at all prickly. They're, they're very soft and inviting. So another tree that um, is available is um, the Kentucky coffee tree. Some people are hesitant to plant Kentucky coffee trees because the females produce a kind of wooden uh, castanet like but espresso is a male and does not produce any fruit or seed pods whatsoever. So you get all the advantages of a very uh, upright tree that grows uh, 60 to 70 feet tall with a strong central leader and dappled shade because although it's a big tree when fully grown, the leaves and leaflets on this tree are very small, somewhat reminiscent of if you know what a black locust leaf looks like or honey locust. They have that same kind of small leaf, so bits of sunshine can stream through. Good for growing grass underneath, so kind of a good tree if you're interested in keeping the lawn in your planting strip. And they will turn yellow uh, in the fall. Um, so a tidy tree, relatively few pests and diseases. The one uh, thing about Kentucky coffee trees is they do leaf out relatively late in May, so um, they're one of the last trees that, that um, have leaves on them in, in our climate. But they're a tree that does not seem to be subject to a lot of the diseases that more uh, common and familiar trees are, and a fairly limited uh, natural range in the Ohio River Valley of the eastern U.S. So, uh, lindens. We've already mentioned um, the summer sprite, which is the tiny linden that's half the size of normal. Here's what a, what a tree that's more than regular size, 40 to 50 foot tall, 30 foot wide, that's to see a little leaf. Certainly green spire fits the bill for people that are looking for a dense, densely leaved shade tree. With um, Green spire uh, was selected because it does have good upright growth, nice regular branching, and, and fairly good yellow fall color. So good structure on this tree. Um, one thing about lindens is they have very large um, root plates, so they tend to need the full size width and um, they don't like to have their roots at all cut, so it's a, a, something to consider that um, uh, when planting these that you don't want to be um, uh, putting them anywhere where you might be planning to put in a driveway where you might have to cut the roots. So they do need the full amount of space to, to maintain a good, uh, strong connection to the ground. Um, something in our dry summers that is... Um, these trees are a little bit unhappy with our dry summers, so that can attract aphids, and again, where you have aphids, you're going to have a little bit of that um, honeydew, and some people don't like the, the, that um, sticky, sooty um, uh, exudate that falls off of the, the trees when they're infested with these aphids. On the other hand, earlier in the spring, in the month of June, you get these delightfully scented, highly fragrant yellow flowers that are very um, attractive to bees and other uh, nectar-seeking pollinators. So it's kind of a trade-off. Um, the good insects come in June to pollinate, and you get great fragrance. And then in August, September, when the tree is a little bit stressed, you may get aphids, something to, to weigh. Now, Redmond is a different species, um, native to North America, whereas the little leaf lindens are European. It's about the same size as green spire. Um, uh, about 25 feet wide, again, selected for good branching. Um, so very similar in respects to the pale yellow flowers, 
and that are fragrant in June, large leaves. And so I guess the, the main choice between Green Spire and Redmond is whether you want a European tree, which is not native to this continent, or an American species um, that was native to North America. Not native, however, to Oregon. But fairly similar in terms, perhaps somewhat larger leaves on the Redmond. Um, American lindens tend to have larger leaves than their uh, European counterpart, the little leaf linden. Now, in the Midwest, where the conditions are extremely tough, places like Chicago, they're planting a lot of hackberries. Um, the experience in Portland has been a little more mixed um, than the success they've had with these trees in Chicago. Um, these Midwest natives um, are a deciduous tree that uh, has kind of papery, sort of like sandpaper type leaves. They're a little bit rough in texture. They can grow quite tall, 40 to 65 feet even and about half that width. Um, they do have a kind of a yellow, small, but very attractive to bird um, uh, nutlet that occurs on them. That's the hackberry from the name. And here's what um, they look like. Their main claim to fame is when they get older, the bark has a raised, ridged effect. It's very noticeable, and um, it doesn't take too many years for that to start to appear. As I said, the foliage in summer is kind of middle of the road, not especially attractive, does turn kind of a pale yellow in fall. Um, there are some nice examples of this tree in Laurelhurst Park near the pond, but we have had difficulty with some of the younger trees getting them to establish. Not quite sure what's going on there. All the literature suggests that they should be very, very hardy trees, certainly to cold, but we're not sure summers that um, is causing young trees to have difficulty establishing themselves. So um, the literature may be more promising on these than our actual seeing getting them to grow in Portland. But as I said, some that are growing near water have done quite well in Laurelhurst Park. Uh, might be the kind of tree that you might um, plant only if you're going to give it um, reasonably good water for the first several years. Harvest Gold Linden. Um, this was developed for the cold conditions in Canada and the northern uh, Midwest, so it is very tolerant to cold weather. And um, the other thing about it is, unlike a lot of lindens, which will have some of their leaves green and some of their leaves yellow, Harvest Gold tends to have all the leaves turn yellow at the same time, so it's more effective uh, to have solid yellow um, on the tree. So if you're looking for a linden for that uh, fragrant yellow flowers, this will have that, um, will attract bees, and then it has the added bonus of having that, I would say, better fall color than most of the other lindens, and a more upright growth. A little bit shorter, um, The we have young trees that are the ones that I've seen, but literature suggests that this could get uh, probably only in the 40, 45 foot range, so a little bit shorter than perhaps some of the other lindens. And supposedly, this is better at resisting aphids than uh, the American linden, the Redmond, or the Green Spire might be. Um, Western red cedars are, of course, um, the native tree that um, our Native American people revered the most. It's a very useful tree for uh, its wood, but also for wildlife, which depend on the evergreen foliage to hide from cold winter winds and escape um, cold, icy blasts. Um, typically, the full western red cedar is a very large tree that grows over 100 feet tall and can be um, uh, probably require a large planting strip. But in Gresham, um, a narrow form, pyramidal form that you see here on the right, um, was discovered that stays fairly narrow and fairly pyramidal, and or cone-shaped as this is also called, and half as wide as it is tall. So it was selected and clones of that were distributed. We actually have a native tree that has a lot of great attributes, very long-lived trees that can live hundreds of years that are adapted to our climate. Um, cold winters we have with this more narrow shape and um, discovered right in the local area. 
Now, western red cedars, although they're native, they're usually growing along streams or down in uh, areas where they can get um, close to water. So they're not as going to be as drought tolerant, say, as a Douglas fir or an incense cedar or a ponderosa pine. So especially when they're young and still forming their roots, you will want to water these fairly, um, fairly well until they get established. Um, so something to keep in mind, not all natives can, can um, you know, survive a completely dry summer. But an interesting shape, nice, tight, dense foliage, and good wildlife trees. Scarlet oaks. They're from the eastern United States. They have absolutely live up to their name in terms of the scarlet fall color. Uh, this is a tree that was planted in 2006. You can see it's already grown much faster than most people think a oak tree would grow. Um, uh, interestingly, behind it, you can see a western red cedar there, ironically, the, not the Hogan, but the full species. But at any rate, if you're looking for fall color and you want uh, an oak tree with all the attributes of solid, strong wood, um, this would be a good species to consider. The foliage is also, unlike red oaks, the foliage is much more deeply um, incised, and so it makes for um, a little lighter uh, effect than, say, the red oaks. Um, these trees will uh, turn red and then they'll, the leaves will dry and turn brown. They will stay on the tree, which actually is beneficial in the sense that it helps intercept winter rainfall even though the leaves have already turned color and, and gone brown. They'll immediately fall off the tree. Sometimes they will stay on until spring. And as I said, that's good for, for, for winter rainfall interception. But some people don't like uh, the fact that they've got brown leaves on their tree all year. So I do point that out if that's a problem. If you prefer to look at kind of a gray skeletal a tree, then this would not be that kind of a tree because it'll still have leaves clinging to it well into the winter. This is also available on um, the eight-foot list without power lines. So like a very um, kind of tree that um, your grandkids could probably put a swing in one of the big branches because uh, it's strong enough to support the weight when it's fully established. So moving on, then we only have, I believe, two lists to go. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. So um, these are the six footer with power lines. And we have a number of um, trees that we've already seen available on this list. So I'll just kind of quickly review what's on this list that we've already seen pictures of. The American Hornbeam. This can have gold to red fall color and strong wood. Um, very tidy tree, does like water in the spring. The Amoromachia, tough tree. Once it's established, you probably won't need to give it summer water, summer flowering, and not much in the way of fall color, however. Now, a tree, um, uh, the Chinese dogwood we've already gone over, uh, does need summer water. Um, we do not have magnolia. We've sold out of that. That was an evergreen tree. Um, Galaxy magnolia with pink flowers. Uh, Japanese hornbeam which is a tidy tree but does like summer water. Persian ironwood, which is a drought tolerant, tough tree, variable fall color, but usually uh, any, butter yellow to um, orange purple. Pink Donjitalpa for those pink summer flowers, no seeds, um, not much fall color. And then the Washington Hawthorne, which has got reasonably good fall color, white flowers in the spring, and knockout red cranberry style fruits that hang on the tree after the leaves have fallen. Now there's a number of fruit trees and two deciduous trees that we'll talk about in this um, strip. The four types, or there's actually five types of fruiting trees and two ornamental deciduous trees. Um, and we'll kind of take them one at a time. So we don't normally offer a lot of apples because apples require typically to prevent um, them from being completely overwhelmed by diseases, usually require some kind of spraying and we're reluctant to recommend street trees where they're out in the neighborhoods that require a lot of spraying, but Spartan is a little more resistant to those diseases. It can get scab and canker, but resists better than a lot of other varieties. Um, it was developed in Canada, in fact, up in British Columbia, um, and is a uh, tree with, or it has a fruit that has white fruit, kind of like a Macintosh, which is one of the parents of this tree. Um, it has fairly sweet uh, taste, so it's good for eating just fresh off the grocery um, uh, store or off your own tree, and also good for juicing. 
for creating apple juice. Now, all apple trees are going to be somewhat short-lived, um, although um, they can live for a long time. The majority of particularly uh, cloned apple trees are, are shorter-lived trees, so not exactly a tree that we're leaving as a, as a legacy for future generations. They do have, uh, apple trees do have a short, very brief flowering period in the spring, and um, sometimes they will need to have their fruits thinned in order to make sure that the branches don't break under the weight of the, the fruits. But as you can see here, this is a red apple with white flesh and fairly sweet. Now Asian pears are going to live much longer than apples, typically 100 years or more. Um, there's examples in, in Asian countries of trees that are still bearing fruit well into their second century, which is unusual for most fruit trees. Even if they live longer, they may not be bearing fruit in their old age. But Asian pears are consistently good at bearing fruit well into their um, second century. Now, one thing about Asian pears, they do need, typically, they'll ha here's an example of a Asian pear. You can see they're sizable, about the size of a baseball. And they will create these clusters of fruit that you should thin apart if you're going to um, take full advantage of having the fruit later in the year. Um, trees uh, that are typically 15 to 25 feet tall and the kind of clones that we have, um, you can see here what they look like in the winter with the leaves off. Here's a close-up of the two varieties that we're offering this year and uh, are getting more than one. That's great because typically you get more uh, fruit if you have two different clones planted close together or get your neighbor to plant one in their yard. Um, they can be self-fertile, but the fruit is definitely, the fruit production is definitely enhanced when you get two different clones. So Nijiseki is also known in, under its English name, 20th century, um, probably the most common Asian pear that you see planted. These are somewhat susceptible to fire blight, which is unfortunate because they are a great tasting, um, light-skinned um, Asian pear here that probably has more flavor than Nijiseki. Um, and most Asian pears will put on um, some fall color, usually gold, sometimes hints of orange and red. Now Shinseki does have nice foliage, fairly self-fruitful, and again, you can see that the consistency of Asian pears, if you've never had one, they have kind of the shape of an apple and the, more of the consistency of a pear, so a little grittier kind of a taste like you'd expect in a pear, and um, not quite as juicy as a pear, as a pear, as a pear, an apple, pear, an apple. Uh, where these cultivars come from, they're, they're known as the apple pear. Um, Shinseki also tends to ripen a little bit earlier in the year. Um, in California, they ripen even as early as August. Here, that might be, depending on the kind of summer we've had, maybe September. Now, European pears, which are probably more familiar to most um, people tuning in tonight, are going to have the typical pear shape. Anjou and Comice are the two varieties that we offer. White flowers in spring, similar to the ornamental flowering pears. Pear trees are longer lived than apples and cherries and most other um, uh, fruiting trees. Um, in that sense, they're a little bit similar to the Asian pears. Uh, they are, uh, Comus, for example, is good for fresh eating, I understand. And um, these would be ripening in generally around September and October. Now, the persimmons from Asia are excellent trees. They have wonderful fall color, red-orange in the fall, and there's two types. There's astringent and non-astringent. Hachia is a more tree-like uh, form. Its fruits, which you can see here, kind of uh, have a come to a point, sort of like a top. Um, they're triangular in shape. And those are uh, fruits that have to be picked, well ripened until they're fully mature, and then they can be eaten. If they're eaten prior to being fully ripe, they actually will be astringent, meaning they'll kind of make your mouth pucker. So um, uh, they ripen, like all Asian persimmons, they tend to ripen toward October, late October, November year, or a little bit earlier, I guess we're into December already, but November is kind of the month when, but about the time that the leaves are turning color. And it's nice because they don't attract 
which might be attracted to um, late summer uh, fruiting uh, trees, for example, cherries that fruit in the summer, or um, um, flowering plums can attract, say, insects like yellow jackets in the, in the summer months. These are well past the time when most insects are out and about. If you don't harvest them, the birds will definitely appreciate the, the fruit, and so any left on the tree will, will get probably um, devoured by your local bird life. But they can be harvested, and the nice thing about persimmons at this juncture, we don't see them needing to be sprayed. So um, a little careful pruning, these trees can serve quite well for your um, planting strip be an edible landscape tree. Now, plums are prolific um, producers. They're smaller trees. They're, they barely qualify as a tree, um, usually more broad than they are tall. Beauty was selected uh, because it does seem to be a good producer. And they can be subject to bacterial canker. You can combat that with a copper spray. I understand. You might want to check with your home orchard society. It's a tree that is um, beauty, apparently, fruits after just two to three years from planting, which is uh, the, for those people that don't want to wait a lot for a crop, and they are this kind of attractive plum color. Um, again, uh, brief period of flowering in the spring, kind of apple-like flowers, and um, not especially great for fall color. Plums tend to be short-lived. There are a number of diseases that can shorten that short lifespan even more, um, so you are somewhat taking your chances when you when you have a, a plum tree. Two trees that we offer that are ornamental in this strip um, are the uh, tupelo, also known as the black gum. Um, some people from the south call them pepperidge trees. These are two tre these are trees that have two great things for wildlife. One, the small flowers, although insignificant, are very rich in nectar. In fact, beekeepers tell me that it's one of the best trees for bees to gather nectar from and other pollinators will also appreciate having it as a source of nectar. And they produce small, kind of blue-like fruits that are absolutely devoured and relished by local birds. They're trees that are long-lived, well over 100 years, some reports up to even 200 or more years. And they're a tree that um, is variable in height, 30 to perhaps 50 feet tall, and excellent fall color. Probably the main reason to grow them is the orange to very uh, deep red fall color. Um, you can see here the small blueberry-like fruits, and usually these are not much of a problem because the birds will typically take them from the tree before they even hit the ground. These are trees that um, are a little bit strong summers. They will grow much faster and have more glossy, beautiful foliage um, if you water them in the summer. Uh, once established, they may only need to be watered once a month, but definitely trees that uh, appreciate getting a little boost uh, in the summer because they do come from uh, places in the east coast where it rains in the summer. But generally very upright trees, a little more spreading when they get older, and um, although there are a few diseases that can attack them, most of the ones that we see in Portland have done just fine. And interesting kind of alligator bark when they get older. Now, um, a tree that um, is always, uh, every time I take a tree walk in Portland, people ask about this tree because of the purple foliage. It's the forest pansy redbud. Now their new foliage is very purple. They have the same kind of a rosy pink flowers that you can see on the picture at the right. And these flowers are um, uh, appearing before the leaves. Very, um, very interesting, kind of a hazy purple effect, but, but short-lived. The main claim to fame for forest pansy redbuds is this purple foliage. It does fade to a green color in the late summer, but any new growth that appears in the summer, uh, so if you have a younger tree, there will typically be this new purplish growth and then the faded older uh, gray purple or green purple. Now, the forest pansy redbuds are a tree that some people plant them and say that theirs just took off and grew great. Others people say they couldn't get it to grow for love your money. So it does seem to be a bit temperamental. All redbuds are subject to a disease called verticillium wilt. So if you've had, say, a maple tree that's died verticillium wilt in your planting strip, you would not want to plant any, but especially a forest pansy, 
in the same planting space because the disease can persist in the soil. So something to be cautious about. Um, people who've grown them and they've survived are very happy with them. They tend to be a fairly broad tree, as, as, certainly as broad as they are tall, which is why we offer them in those broader strips under power lines. Um, and even if it does survive and grows to maturity, red buds tend to be a tree that lives about 40 years. Now, very fast growth, it will be a full tree, perhaps within 10 to 15 years you've got a full-grown tree, and you'll probably be able to enjoy it you know, for 30, 35 years, but they're not a very much longer than 50 to 60 year tree. Now our last list of the evening is those lucky people who do not have power lines and who have strips that are wider than eight and a half feet. Now for you folks, you can grow the very largest trees that are gonna provide the greatest benefit for our urban forest. And that's exciting because these are definitely, every one of these trees is the kind of tree that um, is potent, has the potential to outlive the people that planted it and possibly their children. So we've already gone over the Accolade Elm, which is yellow fall color and resistant to Dutch elm disease, the Dawn Redwood, which is the living fossil that was rediscovered in the 1940s and is now available to be planted as a deciduous conifer with nice orange to russet fall color. And then, of course, the scarlet oak, which is a tough-as-nail, strong, um, hundreds of years lifespan tree that does live up to the name scarlet with beautiful red, deep red, the fall color, and a very attractive, deeply incised leaf. Those three, three um, choices are available. But we also have six new choices that um, have not been shown before. So let's dive in and take a closer look at those, shall we? I always like to promote native trees were possible and the incense is probably one of the best for um, people looking for conifers that fit well in an urban environment because although it can grow 60 to perhaps 100 feet tall over many years it stays relatively narrow and upright um, certainly during the first 50 to 100 years of growth and these are trees that will live many hundreds of years um, they um, are kind of an understory tree in a lot of the western forests in Northern California and Southern Oregon. Um, they, however, because of that, seem to have a fairly long lifespan so that they can outlive some of the trees around them and then break up into the canopy and shoot up into the canopy to get into the light as those other trees die. So that may be one of the reasons why they're so long lived. But because they do come from that uh, dry southern Oregon climate. They're really good for dry summers. Once you get them established and, and watered the first couple of years, they generally don't require a lot of additional pampering. Uh, there's a few diseases that can get to these trees. They are an alternate host for the cedar apple rust. The rust can be fatal to a lot of the um, apple family members, but it seems to just um, have, um, it doesn't seem to actually kill the the incense cedars. There, there can be some foliage turning uh, brown on them, but for the most part, these are trees that are tough, pretty resilient, and um, do best in a full sun situation, which is uh, great to find a tree that, that will not scorch in that kind of situation. The other nice thing about them is if you're, um, if you plant them somewhere where they can intercept the east winds, they are great for reducing your winter heating bills because they do provide that year-round um, protection against cold winds. The other nice thing about them, besides the um, kind of attractive bark on these trees as they age, is they have very small cones, so they're not going to um, uh, bonk you on the head as you, as you leave the house or as your neighbors walk under them. Um, so smaller cones, a fairly flat type of spray, uh, the foliage is held in these flat sprays, and like I said, a tough as tough as nails um, tree. This is also the tree that most pencils are made out of these days, and they also make them um, into Venetian blinds, so you may already have some uh, incense cedar wood in your house. Now, Northern Catalpa is a large, probably the largest flowering tree that we offer, uh, 40 to 60 feet tall, about 30 to 40 feet wide, and imagine coming out on a, a day in June with a tree that's absolutely covered in large masses of tube-shaped flowers. It's gorgeous. There's some in um, Grant Park that you can see, and they're easily seen from clear across the park. 
So spectacular trees. They look very tropical. The leaves on catalpas are large, bigger than an outstretched uh, human hand, and they do provide a sense of um, kind of lushness to the tree. Fast, fast growing trees. They shoot up. They do like summer water to get established, and um, that helps them uh, reach that uh, lush lushness. Here's a close-up of the tubular flowers. You can see they're not perfectly white. They're we, we think these are actually designed to help pollinators find their way to the nectar inside. Um, purple and yellow, so they're, they're interesting up close. Big showy masses of them. They're followed in the fall months by these cigar-like bean pods. The other name for the tree, alternate name, is the cigar tree. And fall color, not especially great, um, kind of a yellow-green, but mostly grown for um, the relief it provides in the form of summer shade, beautiful flowers late in the summer when you're probably uh, spending more time in the evening out for walks and the daylight is long, so you can enjoy the flowers more than some trees that bloom, say, in March or April when it's cold and the days are still short. Now, not everyone likes the seed. The, the bean pods are not edible. Um, they generally dry and will then split and, and the, the tiny seeds inside kind of fly away in the wind but they will persist after the leaves and kind of hang on the trees. Some people, it doesn't bother them. Um, other people uh, don't like them, but it, um, it's something you have to weigh against this spectacular flower show. Now, northern catalpas live about 75 years, sometimes a little longer than that, maybe up to 100 years. But again, um, they're putting a lot of their energy into these spectacular flower shows, and in exchange, they don't seem to live as long as, say, uh, some of the oak trees. We have a hybrid of the American catalpas, hybridized with a tree from China, and this has um, many of the same characteristics of the northern catalpa, a little shorter perhaps, but just as fast uh, growing, big showy leaves. Main claim to fame is in the spring, as the new leaves are popping out, they're going to be smaller, and any time during the year that it puts on new growth, those will also be purple. The flowers, although tube-shaped, are also a deep purple color and in the throats. So they're white with purple throats. And again, a fast-growing tree that will have the same cigars that the um, uh, northern catalpa has. And then uh, some of our last trees that we have, the Oregon white oak. This is probably the tree that benefits more types of, of insects, mammals, and birds than any other that we offer. Native to the Willamette Valley, native to Portland in dry, sunny areas and our kind of upland savannas. Um, this is a tree that has been drastically reduced in its native range because of uh, urban sprawl and the um, suppression of fire. Native Americans used to set fires in the Willamette Valley that would keep the prairie land in the valley open from competing conifers, and that favored Oregon white oaks. Since those fires are no longer um, set, this tree has been outcompeted by a lot of other trees, and so you will still see it in, in remnant grows, but now you can actually grow it in your own yard and bring back a tree that uh, feeds m dozens of different species. Um, it's also very long-lived. Um, we know of trees in the Portland area that are at least years old, and it's not unheard of for this tree to live 300 to 400 years if in, in favorable conditions. What's nice about the Oregon white oak compared to, um, say, tree, many trees from the eastern United States is it's also perfectly adapted to dry summers and wet winters. In fact, it's a tree that once established, you don't want to water it in the summer. You can actually kill it too much water after the first year or two. So um, while it does not have excellent fall color Eastern oaks do, it does have a stateliness and a presence that's really wonderful to see, and it's a legacy tree that you leave for your future generations. Can get 40 to 90 feet tall. It's adaptable to light, so if it's competing with a lot of other trees nearby, it will grow tall to reach the light and have a narrower form. If it's grown all by itself where it can spread out, it tends to do that. So um, again, a tree that we're, um, we know from past climate change that this tree has managed to persist during periods in the time in the past which were much warmer and much colder 
So we think it's a good tree that will continue to persist here even during climate change. And here's what the silhouette looks uh, like on a tree that's actually not that old, um, probably only about a 50 to 60 year old tree. And already um, it's reached um, proportions that give it a lot of uh, presence. So for those who want more of an edible landscape and a bigger tree, we offer the Carpathian English Walnut. These are uh, trees out of Europe that have a very deep taproot, which makes them um, you know, nice and sturdy. These trees can get 40 to 60 feet tall, probably more in the 50 to 60 foot range. Very broad spreading. Um, the Carpathians start producing nuts somewhere between 4 to 10 years. It kind of depends on how happy they are where they're growing. And um, the one drawback I would say um, to Carpathian, although it's very hardy because it's a European origin, is it doesn't leaf out or uh, until fairly late in mid-May to June. So um, it is like the Kentucky coffee tree, one of the last trees to put on leaves. Now, if you're growing a lot of spring bulbs, that may be just fine. Um, be aware, though, that English walnuts have an ability to put out a chemical called euglone or juglone, which is um, not... Uh, well, which actually inhibits the growth of tomato and um, plants in the nightshade family, potato and tomato family. So if you're trying to grow tomatoes under it, this would not be the tree to grow. Uh, western red cedar. We've talked about the Hogan western red cedar. This is the straight species that comes straight out of our, our wetlands and woodlands. Uh, this is a tree that will um, shoot up to 100 feet or more. Um, but still stay only about 25 to 40 feet, which means you can actually grow it as a backyard tree or in a, in a wide strip. Again, this is a tree that the Native Americans used for everything, totem poles to canoes to log houses to their, to their clothing was actually made out of the bark of these trees. So um, a tree that is held in high regard and will generally be pest and disease free for most, most people and provides ample shelter for uh, not only birds but other wildlife during the winter months and can again, if planted on the east side of your house, can protect against those cold east winds as well as provide year-round benefits for uh, noise reduction and, and air pollution reduction. This is what the foliage looks like and again, like the incense cedar, very small cones that are not going to create the same kind of problems that some pine trees with very large pine cones might um, or even our Douglas fir, which has fairly large pine cones itself. These will have small cones that typically are fairly uh, easy to sweep into the to the um, uh, you know to the planting strip and decompose that way. And relatively small needles in these flat sprays, not prickly at all. So that concludes, um, I believe, our list of trees. And if we had questions. From any of us, I'm going to scoot in here, and I've got a dog below me here. Um, <laughs> so actually, no, we've answered the questions that came in. We had a couple questions come in during that, but uh, we answered them directly. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining today. Looks like we had a couple dozen people on the call, so thank you very much. Um, and also thank you to Jim for uh, sharing all this amazing knowledge with us. And uh, of course, this will be available on our website and on our YouTube page. So. Uh, you can tell your neighbors, they can come on, and we're going to be kind of putting in some links to help you find the specific trees so you can jump forward to find the trees you're looking for if you want to come back and, and watch again. But thank you very much, and you all have a very good night. Good night. Thanks again for listening.